Hey everybody, this is the Module 5 lecture on Cognition in SLA. Um, I've got a little bit of a cold, so I might be taking some breaks to uh, drink some water, um, <clears throat> but hopefully I can get through this. Um, so in this lecture, I want to talk through some key terms in SLA research related to human cognition. Uh, understanding these terms will help you to better understand the research Ortega summarizes in her chapter that you read for this week and the Barack and Bialystok uh, article that grad students read. So uh, number one, information model or information processing model of human cognition. The information processing model of human cognition sees the human mind as a computer that is programmed to compute data, um, which is just like outside stimuli. Um, that we receive through the senses in particular ways. Uh, we are hardwired to acquire the codes or representations um, the mind uses to do this over time through interaction with the environment. So it's kind of like when you get a new computer um, and it's designed to work with certain software. Uh, you have to acquire and download the software first in order to get to the computer to do what you want it to do. Our experiences of language learning are like downloading and trying out new software for the first time. Uh, we process, um, or you know, the term that Ortega uses is access, new information using this new software through both automatic and controlled processing. The idea is that the more that we use the language, uh, the more its use will become automatic, so we can expend less conscious um, or controlled energy using it. According to this model of the way the mind works, and let's just keep in mind it's only a model, it's a theory, um, we can assess language learning through dual task tests. These tests ask an L2 learner to do something in the target language while they do something else at the same time. For example, count flashes on a computer screen. The idea, uh, the theory is that if enough of their L2 processing is automatic, uh, they'll perform well on the other task. Uh, because they have con the conscious energy freed up to do so. If they perform poorly on the other task, it means they're expending too much energy on the language task and they don't really know the L2 that well. The Barack and Bialystok article talks about the effects of bilingualism on a person's executive control. If we stick to the computer person analogy, executive control is like a person's operating system. It's what enables and coordinates their behavior. Uh, Barack and Bialystok study suggested that being bilingual can enhance your executive control beyond just language-related tasks. So bilingualism may support people developing a more sophisticated operating system that they can use, you know, completing all kinds of tasks in their life. The research has other implications too, um, so I'm looking forward to hearing what the grad students uh, who read the article have to say about it on the forum this week. All right. Uh, second major topic, uh, skills acquisition theory and proceduralization. Skills acquisition theory is the theory that learning is a gradual transition of a person's performance of a particular skill, like using another language, um, from control to automatic. It's like when you're first learning to drive a car, um, you're likely to have to think a lot about where you put your feet, um, the pressure that you exert on the pedal, how much to turn the wheel, etc. But as you become a more skilled driver, you don't have to think so much, and much of this activity becomes automatic. Proceduralization refers to this process of making skills automatic um, through repeatedly practicing them. <clears throat> so if, you know, if we buy all this, um, how do we facilitate this process in the classroom um, for L2 speaking and writing and listening and reading? So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this in the forum. Third major topic is memory. Memory is where we store the representations, right, or we can think of these as codes, um, we use to process information. Long-term memory is where we store our explicit declarative knowledge. So this is knowledge that we can cons consciously recall and describe. Um, and implicit procedural knowledge. So these are things that we know that are more subconscious, right? Um, and, you know, this applies to lots of things, including language. Long-term memory can be considered in terms of semantic memory, which is like common knowledge, um, and episodic memory. So this is um, our knowledge of events that we've lived through. 
SLA research has used these ideas about long-term memory as a way to study the depth um, or strength of a person's L2 vocabulary. The idea is that the degree to which people can recognize, use, and describe words reflects the degree to which those words and their meanings have become encoded in explicit, implicit, semantic, and episodic memory. Working, or short-term memory, is where we store information that we haven't yet encoded in our long-term memory. Um, and maybe that information will never make its way into long-term memory. It's also where we process some of this information by integrating it with info into our long-term memory. So Peter Robinson uses the metaphor of a workspace to describe this. Um, you can think of your working memory as like a workbench in your garage. Um, it's where you both store and use certain tools to complete a task. After you've built that, you know, birdhouse or whatever, you might discard some of these tools and keep others, uh, storing them away in long-term memory. Working memory has a limited capacity. Uh, there's only so much space to work and you have to activate it in order to use it at all. SLA researchers have suggested that people who have larger working memories and are more capable of using them can learn L2s faster and achieve more ultimate attainment, um, more in terms of ultimate attainment, than those with a more limited working memory. I always think about this as like my, me and my husband. Like my husband has a really, really good working memory. He's, excellent at memorizing things and he's really good at learning languages. I think I have like a little smaller tool bench, <laughs> so it, it takes a lot more for me. I am a slower learner. All right, fourth major topic is implicit learning. Implicit learning is like the way a child learns a first language without being told explicit rules through immersion and practice. SLA researchers have debated whether this is possible for an L2 learner. Although the jury remains out on this one, there is some evidence that suggests that implicit learning can play a role in second language acquisition. The theory is that through implicit um, or unconscious processing of linguistic input, learners can abstract the rules of the language and eventually use them to produce the language, even if they can't verbalize the rules. Rather than being instructed in the rules and then practicing them, um, this is the model of L2 teaching and learning associated with skills acquisition theory, uh, learners can be exposed to L2 input um, and make subconscious associations based on what they observe and experience. For example, learners can, over time, figure out the rule for plurals in English, which is you know, adding that S to most nouns, through seeing and hearing a bunch of plural nouns over time, rather than being told the rule and then practicing it. Last major topic, emergentism. So emergentism is a movement in the cognitive and social sciences, as well as the humanities, to see things, you know, people, languages, societies, etc., from a more ecological point of view, um, as constantly emerging in relationship to what's going on around them. So it's like in the 50s and 60s, right, when like, you know, cognitive cytology was developing, um, everything was about computers, right? That was like the dominant metaphor. Today, the dominant metaphor is becoming ecology, right? And so you might see that word ecology in, um, you know, some pedagogical and, um, you know, psychological research that you read, like in this and other classes. If languages and language users are part of a complex ecology of people, places, and linguistic forms, that they aren't stable, but constantly in flux. According to this perspective, it's impossible to measure a person's L2 knowledge in a linear way using a pattern of development, right? So like beginner, intermediate, advanced. How much a person knows depends on where they are at a given moment, right? Whether they're in a foreign language class, a nation that loot you know, uses the target language, their home, etc., whom they're talking to, what they're saying, etc., right? It's all context dependent. Emergentism in SLA puts the focus on how people learn and use languages in complex ecological systems of communication and how teachers can foster classroom ecologies that support effective language learning and use. So it's less a top-down, rule-based uh, pedagogy and more bottom-up, practice-based instruction. 
In this way, it breaks down traditional distinctions in SLA based on cognitive, cognitivist thinking, like confidence and performance, representation and access. Uh, according to emergentism, confidence is performance. Representation is access. Uh, I think this approach is exciting. I think it's super interesting. Um, but it poses challenges uh, for SLE researchers and teachers. First, it makes teaching entirely context dependent. Uh, so it's hard to generalize rules or best practices uh, we can use in different classes in different places. Second, it makes it really hard to assess language learning uh, since language knowledge and languages themselves are considered to be constantly changing. So what do you think about this perspective? Could it inform your teaching? If so, how? All right, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say on the forum. Bye.